1962, two men would take on the roles that were to define them for the next 20 years. Steptoe and Son would become a British sitcom classic, introducing us to iconic characters and catchphrases. You dirty old man! The show made Wilfred Bramble and Harry H. Corbett international stars, but it would also throw a spotlight onto some painful secrets and a very public scandal. They're both trapped, but I think without each other they couldn't survive. We'll reveal the scandalous court case that almost tore the show apart. They arrested him on the spot for that and dragged him off to the police station. A shockingly frank admission exposes how the legendary sitcom changed the fate of the nation. And I've sometimes wondered what effect my decision had on British political history. We'll uncover the truth about the tensions between the two stars. A lot of people think Harry H. Corbett and Wilfred Bramble didn't get on. There's more of that story than meets the eye. And how Sooty accidentally ended up with an OBE. Tonight, we reveal the shocking secrets and scandals of one of Britain's most influential sitcoms. It's autumn 1964. Britain is reading the Sun newspaper and watching Match of the Day for the first time. Liverpool gets right into the edge. 24 million viewers are tuning in to Steptoe and Son. The Conservative Party has been in power for 13 years and a general election has been called for the 15th of October. This nation is faced with a choice and I believe that our people will weigh that choice. Following an extraordinary decision by the BBC, Steptoe and Son is about to help change the course of British political history. Over 50 years later, the revelation is still unbelievable. On the night of the 1964 general election, there were fears that the huge popularity of Steptoe and Son could keep voters, particularly working class voters, at home and not going to the polling stations. So Harold Wilson suggested gently that it should be moved to after the polls closed and uh, so that people could get out and vote. In an unprecedented act of intervention with world-changing consequences, the leader of the opposition, Harold Wilson, went to the home of the BBC Director General and asked him to delay the broadcast of Steptoe and Son. In this candid interview long hidden in the BBC archives, Sir Hugh Carlton Green himself reveals what happened. He came round to have a drink. Uh, he had been very much upset because the BBC had planned the beginning of a series of repeats of the very popular light entertainment programme Steptoe and Son on the evening of polling day. And he thought that would keep away particularly Labour supporters from the polls. He also claimed that it was in breach of an understanding that they had reached with the parties. Uh, the next day, I discussed the matter further with the controller of BBC One, and we thought a good idea would be to shift it from early in the evening until nine o'clock, when at that time the polls closed. I rang up Harold Wilson and told him about this decision, and he said to me that he was very grateful. It might make a difference of about 20 seats to him. He won, I think, by four, <laughs> and I sometimes wondered what effect my decision had on British political history. You heard that right. The Labour Party leader asked the BBC Director General to change the TV schedule to help him win the general election. And the BBC agreed. It seems quite astonishing for us today. You can't imagine something similar happening. But it was a sign of how dramatic the impact of the show was in those days that you would get a leader of a political party actually trying to interfere in that way because of fear of the impact on so many voters. So how did a sitcom get so big that even repeats were so popular they might swing an election? Rewind to a TB ward in 1948. Ray and Alan had met in a TB sanatorium where they had been incarcerated for three years as teenagers more or less lying in bed the whole time. During that time, they'd started writing a few scripts. The sanatorium had a radio station. They decided to 
do their fledgling broadcast on it, they found that they made each other laugh, which is something they did to the ends of their lives. After years honing their comedy skills, resulting in 164 Hancock's half hours, amongst other things, Galton and Simpson were looking for something different. And their years trapped in the sanatorium, along with their working class roots, found the perfect combination in a claustrophobic tale of working class struggle. The BBC had a series that ran of one off called Comedy Playhouse. And Ray and Alan wrote various comedy playhouses. And the one that took off was a show called The Offer. The Offer became the pilot episode of Steptoe and Son and deftly established the dark humour that could be found in their poverty-stricken lifestyle, like collecting the dregs from discarded wine bottles. It's all foolish, what? Good. This will finish it off. What's the matter? The rotten last is thinking gets. Paraffin. <laughs> I can't put paraffin in it. Okay, if you don't want it, I'll have it. I don't mind a drop of paraffin. Oh, you dirty old man. <laughs> Stepson's Son may not be the first working class sitcom, but it's certainly the first serious working class sitcom that has something to say about it's a state of the nation piece. Despite the growth of the welfare state and the increasing prosperity of the post war years, for many in Britain, life was still tough. It was life in the raw, very much. When Steptoe was on the telly, we were still coming out of the war and people had a lot to say and they didn't have much money and nothing had been painted up. That kind of edginess appealed to everybody. We all felt very, how can I put it, unpolished. The war's been over just 15 years. There's poverty, there's, uh, there's degradation, and these two characters are living in, you know, hand-to-mouth existence in London. By the early 1960s, there was a sense of two Britons, an older generation stuck in the past and a younger generation looking to the future and change. For the first time, political satire was allowed on television, and we can reveal that writers Galton and Simpson were keen to do more than just make the audience laugh. Galton and Simpson were very uh, politically uh, motivated. They had come from quite working-class beginnings themselves. Alan's father was a milkman. They had both been quite interested in the Labour Party and had done a bit of canvassing and things for the Labour Party. They certainly had a dinner or two with Harold Wilson. The writers were cheeky enough to even name-check the Prime Minister in an argument during a suitably symbolic game of Monopoly. It's got nothing to do with her. It's only Colt Crown property. Belongs to the government, in actual fact. Oh... So it is Harold Wilson. Oh, God. <laughs> well, it's in the font us out. He knows I vote Tory. He's rigging the boundaries again. He wants all us Tories in one ghetto. I'll drink to that. <laughs> Look, Father, do you think we could have one conversation without bringing Harold Wilson into it? I've changed my mind. I'm not going to buy. Another very funny episode, um, and once again uses the difference they have in, uh, in their political leanings to show how different they are. In fact, the actors were fairly closely aligned with their characters' political leanings. One of the things that Golden and Simpson used to do was to look at the actors and sometimes bring elements into the characters. And they noticed the political divide between Corbett and Bramble. Harry H. Corbett was a staunch Labour supporter and even appeared in character in a party political broadcast. His politics could hardly have been further from those of his co-star. Harry H. Corbett was very left-leaning, whereas Wilfred Bramble was really a kind of old-school conservative. He was quite a snob. He loved the fact that lots of grandees loved the show, and he would get invited to stately homes by the Duke of this and the Duchess of that, uh, and he absolutely adored that. But as for the sitcom writers who'd helped win an election, they were the Labour Party's golden boys, right? word got around that they were living quite a life of luxury in nice houses with Rolls Royces. One day, a representative of the Labour Party came round to them and said, um, 
well, we don't think this is really quite right. And so after that, I think they actively stood back from themselves being involved in the politics. Political intrigue and ideological differences were just the beginning of the secrets and scandals that surround the hit sitcom. Coming up, how Scotland Yard's vice squad targeted Steptoe. He was already on the books of the vice squad and he was basically entrapped. And the astonishing course the BBC chose to decide a star's fate. He could have just quit. He could have just said, no, I can't, not with him on the back of this. It's a cold December night in 1962, and at the BBC's Lime Grove Studios, an expectant audience waits for the recording of Britain's biggest sitcom. What the audience members don't know is that they've been given an extraordinary power. A scandal has put the career of one of the show's stars in doubt. The future of the show itself hangs in the balance and in their hands. So how did such a hugely popular and influential show get to this moment. Wilfred Bramble was leading a secret double life. Like so many men at that time, he was forced to conduct his private life with the utmost stealth at a time when homosexuality was still illegal. But the first series of Steptoe had made the now 50-year-old Bramble an overnight star. And being famous was a dangerous situation for a gay man in the early 1960s. Bramble was a closet homosexual and he was already on the books of the Vice Squad who kept tabs on all kinds of celebrities. Quite often in a very cynical way, they calculated on who they'd go after by how big a name they was. And suddenly Bramble, from being a jobbing actor, was a big name and that meant that he was now under surveillance. On the 6th of November, 1962, Wilfred Bramble was arrested outside a public toilet on Shepherd's Bush Green. But he wasn't merely unlucky. Court documents reveal this was all part of a secret police operation and his fame had made him a target. The police used to deliberately haunt those places of plainclothes policemen and they'd just be waiting for one of the people on their list to go in. And then basically they would grab them. Having been targeted by the vice squad, Bramble was charged with importuning persistently for immoral purposes, an act that would come to be known as cottaging. But the transcripts of the court proceedings reveal the truth of what this supposed importuning entailed. He went into this Shepherd's Bush Green public convenience and smiled at a few people. And that, rather ludicrously, the police would claim was a sign of what they called uh, importuning persistently for immoral purposes. The prosecution alleged that over the course of 20 minutes, Bramble had made four visits to two public lavatories and while inside had smiled at men. No allegation was made of doing anything other than looking and staring at people and smiling at them. He was gay. I, he was found in the toilet of all places by the police. In his mind, and then in the BBC's mind, this is quite a, a dreadful thing for him to be accused of homo, uh, homosexual behaviour. And there was, it, it could be seen as uh, almost career threatening and also the series threatening. At the hearing in mid-December, Bramble was given a conditional discharge and ordered to pay 25 guineas costs. The verdict was reported in the morning papers on the 13th of December, the day the first episode of the new series was due to be recorded. And that caused absolute panic back at the BBC because they knew it was controversial. They had no system in place, no procedure in place to deal with such a controversy. And so people were literally running from office to office on the fourth floor of the BBC saying, what are we going to do about Bramble? Astonishingly, the BBC had not decided on a course of action, even as the audience took their seats. We can reveal that unknown to anyone at the time, BBC executive Bill Cotton was leaving the stars and the show's fate in the hands of the audience. 
The studio audience didn't realize how much power they had in their hands that night. The BBC had decided that they would just literally stand in the wings when they came to recall the first episode for the new series and just see what kind of reaction he got from the studio audience. And Bill Cotton, who's one of the executives, later told me that they, they basically said, if they cheer him, he stays. If they boo him, he goes. And it was on that knife edge when he went out. The episode being recorded was The Bath, which saw Bramble sitting almost naked in a tin bath, being his usual revolting Albert Steptoe self. He could hardly have felt more exposed or vulnerable. Martin, they're having me dinner. What are you doing? I'm onions. Oh, they fell in the water. <laughs> well, you can't put them back in the jar, then. Hey, I don't think I'm going to leave them in the water, do you? I'm not going to in a bar full of pickled onions, can I? <laughs> but the audience loved it. And they loved Wilfred. He and the series were safe for now. He could have just quit. He could have just said, no, I can't, not with him on the back of this, you know. But good for him, you know, for carrying on. I mean, the scrawniness as well. It's very brave. I've done nude stuff. It's awful. He kept his role and the series survived. But for Bramble, this was a double-edged sword. Albert Steptoe, the character he would play for another six series, was a homophobe. One episode called Any Old Iron, uh, Harold is befriended by an urbane man and he doesn't realise the guy's gay, whereas Albert, much more worldly, does and um, tries to put a wedge between the two of them. We know that um, material from this period can look quite crass now and offensive. He's as bent as a boomerang. <laughs> you ask him. I'm not going to go around asking people things like that. Excuse me, my bat's a short puff. Have you any comment to make? Huh? Well, I'm warning you, that's all. I don't understand you. You've got on a brain. You've got puff mania. <laughs> what a fine... And to make matters worse, depictions of gay men at the time were roundly stereotypical. <laughs> this gentleman is an antique dealer. Oh, yes? How'd you do? Oh, what a strong grip you have. A gay friend of mine, um, uh, was very, uh, he was very happy to see this episode at the time because uh, he would just see, he, he saw an underrepresentation of gay people on television and any, any depiction was just sort of welcome as far as he's concerned. But I think it, nowadays it makes, it does, it can make for some uncomfortable watching. So the on screen Albert was a dirty, uncouth homophobe who spoke like a true cockney. But unknown to most of the population, the real Wilfred Bramble couldn't have been more different. Wilfred Bramble, of course, was uh, incredibly posh. Um, and it was always a shock to see him with, his, uh, with, with a good set of teeth in. He would transform himself when he came off set, dress up in a very dapper outfit, put in his own teeth, brush his hair, and he would walk out sometimes with a cane and... He would be unrecognisable and the, the people at the stage door would let him pass by without um, bothering him. Wilfred Bramble was dressed to the nines. I mean, he was so particular and neat and clean and nothing like that character whatsoever. But I do remember thinking what lovely cut glass accent he had. And here it is in all its glory when the pair received a Variety Club Award in 1963. Mr Chief Parker... Distinguished guests, that git has made me start. <laughs> Don't breathe on it, you'll get microbes all over it. <laughs> he always gets me out. Very hoity-toity, in fact, making his potty mouth all the more surprising. But the tensions between Bramble's foul-mouthed, homophobic on-screen character and his real life were difficult to reconcile, and he took refuge in alcohol. At first, the extent of his addiction was known to only a few. He was beginning to drink a bit more. It wasn't as bad as it would get in the 70s, but it was still quite bad that um, when he went into the studio, for example, he would have Steptoe's terrible false teeth soaking in a glass of uh, vodka or whiskey before he put them in. Harry um, 
would be very efficient and ready to go uh, when the director wanted him. And occasionally, I think, probably Wilf was having an extra G&T in the bar and was a bit later back for recording or rehearsing or whatever they were doing. Bramble's drinking was beginning to have an effect on those around him. Ray Galton, I remember telling me, got so frustrated with Wilfred Bramble because, you know, it was a lot of dialogue to learn and he would fluff his line right at the end. And they said, oh, God, he's ruined it. And his alcoholism would continue to cause problems throughout the entire future of the show. Coming up, Harry H. Corbett gets trapped inside a role he could never escape. They certainly knew Harry H. Corbett didn't want to do a series, um, but the BBC made them an offer they couldn't refuse. And the puppet that almost stole an OBE from a Steptoe star. It's 1961, and Harry H. Corbett is carving out quite a reputation as a serious actor. British theatre is booming, and a new generation of writers are tackling serious themes in edgy kitchen sink dramas. But Corbett is about to be offered the role he would play in one form or another for the rest of his life. The role he would never escape from. Harry H. Corbett was a very well-respected actor. He was one of those people that, were, that, that looked upon to make his mark, was considered uh, that he could be a great Shakespearean actor. And, of course, Harry H. Corbett had been working with Joan Littlewood in the theatre workshop um, and had been doing this sort of um, uh, very experimental, very cut-back, realistic theatre. What I call a thinking actor. He would really analyse it. He'd really go deep into the character and get the motivation for why he would do certain things. Things, and he, he's fascinating to watch. Have you done a car for yourself? You don't deserve to get on. I mean, I was in a rut. See, if I don't go now, I'll never go. <laughs> Cheerio. Cheerio. When Corbett received that very first Steptoe script, he replied with, delicious, delighted, can't wait to work on it. And this funny but poignant scene from the end of the episode showcasing his acting range demonstrates why he was so excited. Mm, you rotten, stinking colour! <laughs> I can't go! I can't get away! With the offer, what you had was two straight actors uh, who Although it was funny, although there was comedy in it, and, and the comedy of pathos in particular, the, as straight actors, they played it straight. They didn't play it for laughs. They didn't look for a laugh in every line. They looked at the truth in it. I've got to put the kettle on. I can cut the tea, shall I? Get the old sausages going. You know, sausages, don't That last scene gives me shivers to this day. But I remember uh, Ray Galton particularly was in the, the control box watching it as live being recorded. And Ray Galton turned to Alan Simpson and said, look, look, real tears. This is real acting here. Because they've been writing for comedians like Tony Hancock, Frankie Howard, and people like that. To actually have two proper actors doing dialogue which was both funny and poignant. Uh, it's a revelation, really, that episode. And you think, oh, God, that wouldn't be out of place in a drama. Look at the texture, look at the depth there, look at the... That resonates, I'm sure, with a lot of people that feel trapped and enclosed. It's quite powerful, particularly through comedy. The comedy and the tragedy in Steptoe is very closely aligned. Corbett had only signed up for a one-off. And we can reveal that as far as the writers were concerned, this eternal sitcom was only ever designed to run for one episode. When it had been recorded, Tom Sloan said to them, well, you know what this is, don't you? It's a series. It's a great, great characters. It's going to be a series. And they said, no, no, no. We've worked for seven years on a sitcom and we really don't want another long stretch. And the writers were banking on Corbett being their secret weapon for how to get out of doing more. They certainly knew Harry H. Corbett didn't want to do a series, but the BBC made them an offer they couldn't refuse, and Harry H. and, and Woody Bramble turned around and said, we'll do a series then. 
Corbett's dedication and professionalism continue to shine through, even in this rarely seen rehearsal footage, by now five series in. It's easy enough in this game, the bank gives it to you. Yeah, well, we're not playing. What did you say? I said, the bank gives it to you. That's it. I said, we'll get it from the bank. How can we get it from the bank? We don't even have a bank account. We can open one. How much money have you got? They were very much like little stage plays. And I think that's really quite interesting because it is very theatrical. It was, in fact, very, very theatrical. Harold Steptoe made a superstar out of the unsuspecting Harry H. Corbett. But success came at a price. There's this trade-off when you're an actor. Um, you might become too heavily identified with one show to ever be successful in anything else, or it will, and it will just follow you around. People go, you know, sir, see how bad to him is, so that's gonna... I mean, I get nice all the time, great and all that, but it doesn't bother me. And I know he struggled because he, he always wanted to be a proper actor. This was something that clearly intrigued the media, something Corbett was bluntly reminded of by relentless interviewers. You were a straight actor, yeah. You went on to act in comedy as opposed to becoming a comedian. That's right. And then suddenly everybody says, oh, well, he's a comedian, let's use him for laughs. Yes, I'm afraid so. I'm it is true. So. And most of them based on a kind of steptoe type of character. The success of the show really gradually led Harry H. Corbett to feel very ambivalent towards it. On the one hand, he was proud of it. On the other hand, he came to really hate the fact that because of TV and the fact that millions of people watched a show in those days, it really meant that he was identified so closely as Harold Steptoe. He felt it was losing him roles. Just as Albert Steptoe's homophobia tormented Wilfred Bramble, Corbett can't have been unaware of the irony of the show's entire premise. From the very opening episode of Steptoe, uh, the offer, they actually set the scene of a young man trying to escape. You had uh, Harold Steptoe, a man in his late 30s, uh, chained to his father who used wily methods to keep him in there. Each week, Harold would uh, see, seek a way out of the situation, try to get his own flat, perhaps find a girlfriend and get married, even go on holiday on his own. And each week, the father would contrive to keep him within the confines of, of the rag and bone yard. It was really just about the two of them working out their relationship and how they were going to get by. Very claustrophobic. He couldn't do anything else because he did talk like that. You know, you dirty old man, oh my God, what he you put his foot in now? And if you try and do King Lear like that, it's funny. It wasn't funny in 1959, but it's funny in 1969 because of Stepton Son. So you're sort of trapped in that character. Typecasting is a big fear for an actor. And you've got to be able to decide whether, do I enjoy the work enough to be typecast? I do know where he's coming from. I, I, I wouldn't shy away from a bit of Chekhov or a Shakespeare, or a, you know. The thing is, though, comedy's not a bad place to get trapped in. And if you are going to be trapped in a comedy, one of the most groundbreaking in British TV history is not a bad place to be. They were sort of carving out a completely new idea with Steptoe and Son. They were bringing drama into the comedy and also adult content. It's the first truly adult sitcom. Steptoe was a masterclass in both comedy and drama, often using humour to heighten the power and passion of the acting on display. You frustrate me in everything I try to do. You are a dyed in the wool fascist, reactionary, squalid little know your place. Don't rise above yourself. Don't get out of your hole, complacent little turd. <laughs> yet. <laughs> you are morally, spiritually and physically a festering, fly-blown heap of accumulated filth. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want for your tea? <laughs> when they got into arguments, they sounded like real arguments. These weren't sitcom arguments. These had real venom and anger and years of, uh, of tension building up. I think one of the main reasons working-class viewers took to Steps on Sun was that it was, it was funny, but it was, it was quite realistic. And it was how people talked. Wonderful use of dialogue and language. 
and a sort of fruity language that you only ever really got in serious drama up until then. And they wasted no time in cutting right to the chase. In only the third ever episode, some elements of society were scandalised when in a story about moving a piano, Harold casually dropped the B-bomb. We learnt a very valuable lesson today, mate. Huh? What's that? What goes up can bleed and must stay up there. <laughs> the language might seem tame today, but we can reveal that Steptoe's writers had to get special permission to use the word bleeding on BBC TV, as they fondly recollected in a 2012 radio interview. We knew we'd, we'd probably be in trouble, you see, so... <laughs> Duncan Woods, who was the producer at the time, phoned. His first line was, I'll do what I can. Didn't say, hello, this is Duncan. How are you? And he just said, I'll do what I can. And we knew exactly what he was doing. Apparently, he went to Tom Sloan, and Tom read it, and he said, it stays. That word goes over my dead body. But at that time, believe, that was... That they that wouldn't was believe big... the fuss the next day. In fact, they weren't just pushing the boundaries of language. They were inventing it. The Oxford English Dictionary cites this scene as the first recorded use of a new piece of language. It was eight and uh, twenty. <laughs> twenty? Yeah, it's good hand, isn't it? <laughs> you fixed that hand when I went for a gypsies. Oh. <laughs> I don't have to cheat to beat you. Gypsies kiss, piss. Certainly not what you might have expected from the stuffy old BBC and a highly respected Shakespearean actor. But it changed the mood of what was acceptable on television and it, it kick-started a whole new genre. It wasn't stuffy, it wasn't middle class and it showed people getting one over on the world in the face of adversity. It was, it was the little men sometimes winning. In 1976, the Prime Minister decided that Corbett deserved an OBE, but that became a comedy all of its own. Corbett had only adopted the initial H, as there was already a Harry Corbett in showbiz. Unbeknownst to all involved until it was too late, the OBE had mistakenly been made out to the man whose hand was busy working sooty and sweep. Luckily for everyone, when the error was realised, both men were given the award. But despite the fame, the money, the OBE, when Corbett was pressed on the subject, it's hard not to feel that he was a victim of his own success. Cue another round of butt-clenchingly awkward questions. But how typecast did you get? Because we read all the time that actors are typecast and they're out of work for years and they can't do another job. Yes, that's true. I was, I've been typecast. I wouldn't say I couldn't do another job. I've no. done several stage plays and various other things, you know. Mm. And um, I even had to get out of the country and go to Australia. Yeah. Does that make you annoyed, though? Because, I mean, we, as I say, we hear of actors and actresses' careers being totally ruined by this. Yes, I think it does. They never stopped being Steptoe and Son, really, although they did other stuff, lots of other stuff, uh, in that 20 years period. Um, they were cemented in the hearts and minds of the public as father and son. You know, Harry H. Corbett would be walking down Charing Cross Road and saying, that was the old man! And it got to the point where people would say... How's Albert? And he would just say he's dead. Coming up, we reveal the truth behind the rumours of onset tensions. I mean, they were completely different. And people always say, well, of course they didn't get on. And the disastrous Australian tour that took the pair to breaking point. Harry H. Corbett grabbed him by the lapels and said, never the family, that's the limit. It's 1977. The television series of Steptoe and Son has been over for three years. But Wilfred Bramble and Harry H. Corbett have agreed to revive their characters and take the show on the road, without writers Galton and Simpson, for an arduous six-month tour of Australia, which was to become the nadir of their personal and professional relationship. In 1977, they were invited to tour Australia and New Zealand where the show was hugely popular still, but that turned out to be a disaster. It was all after they went to Australia that we heard the trouble really arose. For nearly six months, the pair would be living in each other's pockets, 
In an uncanny reflection of the toxic and claustrophobic situation Albert and Harold existed within, and it would test their relationship to breaking point. When they were in Australia, the big difference was that they just couldn't get a break from each other. That was, that was the big issue, that back in London when they were doing the shows, they could just go their separate ways. When they were in Australia, they had to do two shows a night together. They had to sit in the dressing rooms together. They had to travel long distances by car or plane together. They were stuck in the same hotel together and they started to really irritate each other. Harry H. Corbett was accompanied by his wife and young family. But Bramble travelled alone, turning increasingly to alcohol as an escape. Because Bramble was increasingly homesick and depressed, he was drinking very heavily, whole bottles of gin in the morning and then building up through the day. And that really led him to behave very erratically. And it really led to very angry clashes between the two of them. But it was more than just a tense atmosphere backstage. Wilfred took out his personal frustrations on the show itself. On one particular occasion, Harry H. Corbett was just left literally on the stage waiting for Wilfred Bramble, who decided, even though he was dressed up as Steptoe, he wasn't going to do it. Harry H. Corbett had to do a one-man show. Bramble's loneliness even brought the pair close to physical violence. Even ones where Bramble, in, in a particularly drunken state, insulted Harry H. Corbett's family. And at that point, Harry H. Corbett grabbed him by the lapels and said, never the family, that's the limit. I think the claustrophobia of being trapped together in a pressure cooker environment means that bad stuff is going to happen. You say things you, you will then later regret. The tour stumbled on to New Zealand, where things would reach absolute rock bottom. They had an early morning radio show to launch the New Zealand uh, part of the tour, and Wilfred Bramble was drunk and basically insulted New Zealand and all the people within it. Just basically said, I hate your bleeping country and your bleeping churches and your bleeping buildings, and I wish I was back in bleeping Britain. And that led to complete chaos. They cut the, the broadcast. Politicians were ringing up the switchboard. The police headed towards the radio station. PR people were in meltdown. It was a complete disaster. It basically ruined the tour, had to be cut short. They were basically bustled back to the airport to leave New Zealand. The disastrous tour saw the star's relationship hit its very lowest point. But some members of the TV show's production team claim to have witnessed tensions long before Australia. My very first day at the BBC was working on Steptoe. And because it was my first day, I was there to trail. Don't get involved, just watch and ask questions when you can. I found out a lot of things about Steptoe. For instance, they didn't talk to each other. It was like trailing on age trails. At the time, both Bramble and Corbett refused to comment on any speculation about their supposed animosity. Even when dogged interviewers convinced there was a story to be had would bring up the issue of their relationship in awkward encounters. And how sick did you get of the rest of the crew? I mean, you did it for years and it went on and on. It could still go on. Yeah, well, we only did it for six weeks of the year. That's a, that's a very small amount of time. Mm. And... Uh, I don't know, it was like going on holiday again, meeting all the, you know, the friends you usually meet on the cruise or whatever, you mm -hmm. know, and then it's all goodbye afterwards. Oh, we'll definitely keep in touch. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Leave me your address. Oh, yeah, give me a ring. <laughs> the two men undoubtedly had their differences. I don't think Wilfred Bramble and Harry H. Corbett would have been natural drinking mates. Harry H. Uh, was quite a sociable person. He would have friends and family to the recordings. Wilfred, he did not have guests and friends at the recordings. He was much more of a solitary character. If Wilfred started to have a bit of a drink problem later, that will affect things and people's patience will wear thin. Especially when lines start going, or you're not in the wrong place and, you know, all that kind of thing. A lot of people think Harry H. Corbett and Wilfred Bramble didn't uh, get on, but actually I'm, I'm, there's more of that story than meets the eye. So was there any truth to the rumours? not according to the people who actually knew them. There was quite a bit of controversy after the series 
about how Harry and Wilfred didn't get on. But um, certainly Ray and Alan and, and myself, to a lesser degree, were not really aware that there was any great problem between them or animosity. It certainly hadn't really made a problem during the recording of the TV series. Alan Simpson confirmed this in a candid interview in 2013, just four years before he died. And during that tour, they, 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 they split and became, they couldn't stand aside of each other. Wouldn't travel in the same car, apparently, you know. And it all, that's when it all finished. When the press got hold of this, it became, it had been like this all along. And I'm here to tell you this is totally untrue. They, when, they, when we started the show and all through the, they got on like a house on fire. And people always say, well, of course they didn't get on, did they? Well, they did get on. They got on beautifully. You can't work together year in and year out. You can't work together if you loathe each other. And there was certainly a lot of respect for each other and they spoke respectfully about each other's talents. In fact, their mythically bad relationship has been greatly exaggerated. Even the disastrous Australian tour wasn't the end of Corbett and Bramble's relationship, either personally or professionally. They were reunited for a final time in 1981. Not on stage, not in a sitcom episode, but in a coffee advert. I brought Abigail home for a very quick demo, Tessie. You dirty little devil. That's a coffee. <laughs> the luxurious setting for father and son couldn't disguise the fact that they were still dogged by their old familiar traits. Made from the very best Arabica beans, you know. I show you my cigarette cards. <laughs> <laughs> and it became like a mini episode of the sitcom and it was so popular that it was written about in newspapers and it sparked a whole new interest in possibly going back to the series. And there were also plans to reprise the stage show back in Australia, where Harry and Wilfred had once so spectacularly fallen out. The only reason why they didn't go on the Australian tour again was the fact that Harry H. Corbett's health was in decline. He'd had heart problems in the past, and he had one heart attack after they agreed to go. Then, then he had another, which proved to be a fatal one. Harry H. Corbett suffered a heart attack and died, aged 57, just months after filming the coffee commercial. We all heard on radio saying Steptoe and Son actor dead and you think it's going to be the old man, right? And it wasn't. It was Harry H. Bless him. By all accounts, Wilfred Bramble was heartbroken by it. Wilfred Bramble died three years later, aged 72. His funeral was a solitary affair, but showed how important the show and the people behind it remained in his life. Only six people attended his funeral, three of whom were Ray Galton, Alan Simpson and Harry H. Corbett's widow. By that time, he was also really so alienated from a great deal of the profession. Alan Simpson said it was one of the saddest things he'd seen because uh, he was this huge star who, who'd made such an impact and uh, he had such a humble and, and such an obscure end. Steptoe and Son's secrets and scandals may have been real and hard to come to terms with, but they don't diminish the genius of the groundbreaking series. Tragedy is a good story, and sad comedians make for a good story, the sad clown myth. Whereas I think people really want to celebrate these people who they've seen and enjoyed on their screens. I think people forget now, looking back 60 years, just how popular it was. And I was swept along with the excitement of it all, the ups and downs of it all, and the ultimate accolade of it all on the screen, which was, yes, it was very exciting. I loved being part of all of that. It was just something very, very special.